This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. Isn't it interesting? We're always telling God what the circumstances. God, the water's drying up. You think God says to Jesus, I didn't know that. Jesus doesn't look at God and say, I didn't know that. Listen, God is never taken by surprise by what goes on, and God is totally aware. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good morning and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. I'm Pastor Bob Yandian and thank you for being here. And I want to really specifically aim this today and tomorrow on ministers, those who have a call into the ministry, or those students who feel like they have a call in the ministry, or if you're just born again, spirit-filled, and you feel like somehow down the road you're going to be called to stand in the place of a minister. I'm not just talking about a business person. Everybody's in the ministry to that extent. There's no such thing as a part-time Christian, and there's no such thing as laity and clergy. I hate those terms because they aren't even found in the Bible. That sounds like, you know, laity, you lay down on the job, you don't do much, you know, you're out there, but you're just not really important in the body of Christ. But clergy, oh my goodness, we're men of the cloth. So I don't know where all these terms came from, but basically once you get born again, you are in the full-time ministry. But pulpit ministry, those who stand behind a pulpit, that's the five-fold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. These are the ones I want to talk to specifically for the for today and tomorrow, or if you feel a calling into that area you may be a Bible school student. I ministered a lot of Bible schools and uh, great numbers of students and already begin to get calls back and, and, and great testimonies of how the teaching affected their lives. And so we learn from each other. You know, here's something too. You're supposed to learn from other ministers. Just don't try to be them. Uh, I see so many that they've gone beyond just learning from somebody. They actually try to act like them, be like them, uh, talk like them. Uh, you can't believe how many students at Raymond, when I was there, walked out after graduation and tried to imitate Brother Hagen. They would, you know, they would try to talk with a Texas accent, twiddle their thumbs, you know, stand at the pulpit like him, tell stories like him. The point of it is, that's Brother Hagen. Let him be unique in that area. But you can learn from him. And the most important thing I can tell you, too, is once you learn from him what he's teaching, then put it inside yourself, store it inside, and let it roll around until it can become part of you. Don't try to imitate him or the way he did. Take the things he has said and apply it to your own life. And there's many times you can use your own stories when it comes to it. But again, you can learn from other ministers. That's why the Bible says that we are to be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We can learn from them. But when it really comes down to it, the main one we're supposed to imitate is God himself, Ephesians 5.1. So we come back to that again. But I want to speak to you because, again, you know, I've been in the ministry now for, sheesh, I guess, 50, 50 years. And, uh, you know, and what the Lord has shown me during that time is so much that I want to share these things with you. And one story I want you to turn with me to is First Kings chapter 17. I want to talk about, again, a calling on your life. The book I'm offering is Let God's Will Find You. The reason why I say that is because so many people run around trying to find the will of God and nowhere in the Word of God. Does God ask people to run around and look for the will of God? Just get busy serving him in whatever capacity that you want to. And then God's will will find you. God never put people in the ministry that were running around looking for his will. He put people in the ministry that were doing something. You know, Elijah, uh, you know, he's, he burst on the scene all of a sudden. But Elisha, his, pre, his predecessor after that, was plowing whenever Elijah found him. Moses was tending sheep when he ran across the burning bush. And, and uh, others, you know, the same thing. Uh, David was tending sheep when God approached him and then actually sent the prophet by that he'd be the next king of the country. But that didn't happen for some time. Let God's will find you. We find this in the New Testament, that when Jesus went to get his disciples, they were fishing, collecting taxes. They weren't just sitting around doing nothing and or running around trying to find the will of God. If you're busy, God's will will find you. God will bypass a million people that are searching, praying, hard looking for the will of God. He'll bypass all those to find one person that's just diligently working. When he finds us, what we'll be doing. That's the point of what God does. And so we're going to talk about Elijah in his life and how God led him. Again, the will of God will find you. And I really strongly encourage ministers there's things you can do that you don't need to call. You know, when a pastor says we need somebody to help with children, you don't need to wait for some angel to come from heaven and say, praying, you know, here's what you're supposed to do. If you have an interest in children, go do it. 
you know, and then on top of that, they say we need somebody to teach a class. If you can't teach your way out of a paper bag and you know you're not called to teach, then don't take it. But if you have a teaching ability, then that's God's will. That's the, the pastor's, the voice of God speaking to you. We need people that will come and teach a class. My first class was seventh grade boys. I just looked for anything. When they said we need a teacher, I go, my hand was up before the word got out of their mouth. I mean, the moment I heard teach start to come, I put my hand up and I volunteered and boy, it was rough on me and rough on the kids. I mean, I was used to, you know, the things I studied, I wanted to teach more to adult level and uh, seventh grade boys I had, I was way over their head, you know. So eventually the church saw that and they found a class of college and career students for me. And man, that was great. I mean, we had ORU students in there and I just had a blast teaching the word of God. We all had fun because again, I found the level, but I just got in there just doing something and doors began to open up. That's what God is looking for. And so in this particular story, we're gonna talk about the fact that God's will found Elijah as it will you, but then there's obedience on your part. This book, again, the announcer will come at halftime and tell you how you can have a copy of that for yourself. But in the meantime, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to read verses 2 through 4. And here it says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, that's Elijah, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you will drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. There's two words I want you to underline. In verse three, it says, get away from here. Underline the word here. Then jump down to verse four at the end of it. It says, I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Underline the word there. We have here and there. And God always leads you from here to there. Now, where where Elijah was at the moment was, he had just come and announced to the king, it will not rain for the period of three and a half years. And what he said was, it won't rain until I say it's going to rain. And not only will it not rain, there's not even gonna be dew that's going to come. And this was the hardest drought for three and a half years that Israel went through. And so he announced that. And of course, right after that, the king tried to get him and tried to kill him. And so the Lord just simply had him run away and go to a place where he could hide so that the king couldn't find him. The others couldn't find him and God could begin to deal with his life. He, he, started, his, he started his ministry here with a great announcement. And that great announcement was that it wasn't going to rain. God spoke to him, but he wasn't prepared for ministry yet. He gave the proclamation, but again, God had him back off. The same thing was true with Moses. God gave a proclamation to him that he would be the deliverer of the nation of Israel and the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And so immediately he went and began to tell people and it was too quick. God made that announcement to him, but God wasn't ready and he wasn't ready for him to step into that ministry. And that's why he had to go to the backside of the wilderness for 40 years as God prepared him. This period, he's gonna be in isolation away from the nation Elijah will be for three and a half years until the time the rain is going to come. And so again, God says, get away from here. And I want you to notice something too in verse four. He says, it will be that you will drink from the brook as I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. I want you to notice you will go as future tense and I have commanded the ravens is past tense. Whenever God guides you somewhere, he has already provided. You've heard that statement where God guides, he provides. I'm here to tell you where God guides, he has already provided. He already always makes provision before you get there. And God was simply saying, the birds are on their way there. Now you need to get away from here and go there because if you don't go there, the ravens are gonna circle for a while and you won't be there. But I've already commanded the ravens to go there. See, God can speak raven and God can speak English and God can speak Hebrew. God can speak anything, but he'd already spoken to the ravens and said, go there and feed because, and so Elijah goes there. And so again, before he went to the brook, God told him to leave here and go there. And God said, you'll drink from the brook. Now that's important because there was a brook of water running through there and the and the and the plague of the uh, lack of rain and the drought had already started at the moment he said that. God had commanded already the ravens to go to Cherith and they were already on their way. And if Elijah stayed here, he would miss God's provision there. There's always a here and there in your life and you don't always stay here for a long time. You may stay for some time, but there's always a there afterwards. And again, if Elijah stayed here, he'd miss God's provision there. God did not command the woman to provide for Elijah, nor did he speak to Elijah until the brook had already dried up. He's going to stay there until the brook is already dry. And here's the point. 
oftentimes when we're in a place as Elijah was, when we see the brook beginning to dry up, when we see, we can already begin to predict what's going to happen if no rain comes. And I know it's not going to rain for three and a half years. And I've only been here for a few months and this, this brook is drying up. But I want you to notice something. You don't jump from here and go to there because of circumstances. You go from here to there because the word of the Lord is speaking to you. And so Elijah has gone to the top of this mountain and there he is on the mountain. And as he's there and this stream is drying up, I'm sure he's looking at it. And I'm sure after a while, the waters begin to taste more and more dirty because there's less water and less water and less water. And pretty soon it's mud. And then pretty soon it's dry. And so again, the brook is literally going to dry up and then God's going to speak to him and tell him to go to the next place. So God did not speak before the water dried, nor did Elijah try to leave before he had heard from God. His next drink would be dust. And that's when God spoke to him. Sometimes we think, God, are you ever going to speak. And we keep talking to God about the circumstances. Isn't it interesting? We're always telling God what the circumstances, God, the water's drying up. You think God says to Jesus, I didn't know that. Jesus doesn't look at God and say, I didn't know that. Listen, God is never taken by surprise by what goes on. And God is totally aware in his, in, in his infinite knowledge of what the circumstances are. And yet we seem to be telling God, look, if I tell you what the circumstances are, maybe you'll jump to the, to the occasion and you'll get in a hurry like I'm in a hurry. And so again, this is not what God did. It came to the point where the next drink was going to be dust. And that's when God spoke to him. Look down at verse eight of that same chapter. First Kings chapter 17 and verse eight says, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. He was at a point called here. At first he was here and then went to there on the mountain at the brook Cherith. Now he's been there long enough to where now it is here. And now the Lord says, I'm going to send you there. And twice in this passage of scripture in verse 18, he says, I want to send you there. He says, arise and go to to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. So you're going to stay there for a while. The word dwell means to stay. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. As God had spoken to the ravens ahead of time to provide for Elijah, God has spoken to the widow ahead of time to provide for Elijah. Elijah's probably right now going, whoo, hallelujah. And on the way as he's going, he's probably thinking, wait a minute, a widow? Maybe she's a rich widow. Maybe her husband died and left her a fortune. And we always have a tendency to think that way. And when he got there, guess what? She was as broke as could be. She had, I mean, her husband had left her basically nothing. And now that she, you know, she's got her son and she's at that point about to make the last little bit of food she has. And she and her son are going to eat it. They plan on dying after that. But during that time, the Lord spoke to her and told her, I'm going to send Elijah to you because Elijah's name was known by that time. Every paper probably began to announce it that, he, that he was on the scene and she knew who he was. And so when he showed up, she was not surprised, but she was honest. She said, all I have is this. And, he, and so Elijah said, we'll take just a bit of it. And of course, God supernaturally began to provide. Wherever God guides, he has provided ahead of time. I've already commanded the ravens and I've already commanded the widow to take care of you. The book is available to you. The announcer is about to come on and tell you how you can have a copy of it. And I will come back right after the break. If you don't know God's will for your life, you can find yourself in a wilderness of confusion. Where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? Which church should I be in? And how do I even know when I've found His will? Or when it seems that you have actually found God's will, the question arises, is this really God's will or just my own personal desire? The answer to finding God's will is to let His will find you. In this small but powerful little book, Bob Yandian answers all these seemingly complex questions with clear and simple biblical instruction and makes finding God's will for your life an easy task. To order Let God's Will Find You, visit the online bookstore at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. 
If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite. Elijah's time here at the brook was over. God's direction change was to move from here and go to there. He was commanded to go from here to there to the brook. Now at the brook, which is now here, God says, I'm going to send you there. And twice he mentioned it there in verse eight. But what he said was, I've already commanded a widow to take care of you there. Again, God had already commanded the woman to provide. God continues to provide even before he calls. You know, I just want to come to this maybe in your own personal ministry. Maybe you are here and the conditions are drying up. Maybe by now you look around and say, Bob, the the brook isn't drying up. It is nothing but dust. There's no water left. Well, understand this. I mean, the water was drying up because of Elijah's command. Elijah, hearing from God, caused this to come to pass. But he didn't rain or he didn't say this unless the Lord spoke to him. He didn't say it's not going to rain for three and a half years of his own volition. He didn't try to change nature himself. God said, I'll suspend nature, but you've got to announce it. So he did it. God told him to. Now God speaks to him again and says, go to the mountain up there, leave here, go to there. Once he was there, the brook dried up at because of what Elijah had commanded to happen and from the Lord, but now the Lord spoke again. And the Lord says, now get away from here and I want you to go there. And twice he mentioned in verse eight, go there. And just like he'd commanded again, the ravens to take care of him uh, when he got to the mountain, he's already commanded the woman to take care of him. God has a plan for you. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how dry everything seems to be. I don't care if all circumstances be turning away from you. Don't you jump before you hear from God. God told you to go there. If you know God led you here, then be here. Don't try to find your own there. Find yourself the there that God has. Because if you go there that you have chosen, you can't speak to ravens and you can't ahead of time speak to a widow. Only God can do that. Guidance and provision is supernatural. God will come through for you. You know, uh, you know, Elijah was faithful just to do what God asked him to do. Are you being faithful doing what God asked you to do? Stay and remain faithful because God will open up a door. He will guide you. Let's come back again to that. God had already commanded the woman to provide for him there. So God continues to provide before he calls you. You can understand that the moment you walk into a bad situation, God didn't get, wasn't taken by surprise. God already has an answer. In fact, before you enter into a time Time of trouble, God has already prepared a way of escape. I can walk into a situation knowing the way of escape was there. Before Elijah got to the mountain, he already knew ahead of time that the ravens were there. Now that he's going to be with a widow, he knows good and well she's going to take care of him. God has said it. That way, when you get there and circumstances don't seem to line up with it, you don't look at the circumstances. You remember the word of the Lord. He promised he would provide for me, and every day at the same time, the ravens came and provided food and and he pro- God provided water out of the brook. But now again, the time has come. And listen, if he would have stayed there, the ravens wouldn't be there anymore. If he had stayed there, there wouldn't be suddenly a stream of water running down there. No, the, the brook was already dried. And on the moment that God spoke, the ravens went and headed off in a different direction. God's timing for them was over. But God's timing has now moved to another place called there, and that is Zarephath. After this, when he, when he comes down... Uh, from this situation, he's going to call down fire from heaven. But I want you to understand something too. While he was there with the widow, problems arose. I mean, here he, again, he found out she was about to have the last of her food and they were going to die. He said, give me a tiny portion of it. That's all God needs is a little portion. And that portion is your obedience to God. He spoke and the woman did what he asked to do. And the moment that happened, we know the story, the meal barrel didn't dry up and the oil continued to flow in her house until the time that the that the uh, drought was over. God provided for her for probably about three years. Probably he was up on that first mountain for about, you know, six months. Maybe he was up there for a year. I don't know. But all that time after that, until the time that the drought was over, she was going to have provision. But here's what happened after that. After that, her son got sick and died. And so then she turned around and blamed it on Elijah with all, I mean, here's meal barrel just overflowing. And here is oil just continuing to multiply every day for her. And when her son died, she turned around and blamed him. She said, this wouldn't have happened if you hadn't come along. You're the one that brought the problem. Well, you know what happened? Elijah raised that boy from the dead. I imagine it didn't say, 
here, but she probably, probably was filled with all kinds of, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sometimes some people don't look to God until a bad circumstance comes and then they blame God. But then whenever the thing is turned around, they thank God for the provisions and all that. But again, they live uh, from circumstances. They only, again, begin to gripe when circumstances are bad. Then they only rejoice when circumstances are good or God turns it around. Elijah remained consistent during that time to obey God. Good, bad situations, he continued to look at God. And this is there the difference of why Elijah was chosen. You're all going to face bad times. Every minister faces bad times. Every Christian faces bad times. I've had people tell me I didn't have these kinds of problems when I was a sinner. The moment I get saved, all hell breaks loose. Well, of course, it doesn't say many are the afflictions of the sinners. It says many are the afflictions of the righteous. You are on the devil's side. Yeah, there's natural problems that every person goes through, but it seems like when you get born again, sometimes it seems like your problems begin to double and multiply. But the Lord said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So I don't care if you got three times, four times more problems than any other minister you know, or even any other Christian you know, God is going to provide. He cannot fail you. He has never failed you. As David said at the end of his life as an old man, I once was young. Now am I old, yet have I never seen the righteous forsaken or his children out begging bread. So after this, whenever the whole thing was over with the widow, Elijah, after three and a half years, this whole thing took place in about three and a half years, the mountain and also with the widow, because when he gets back, now the three and a half years are coming to an end. And he now stands before the king and he stands before all the prophets of Baal. After this, he goes to the Mount, Mount Carmel, and that's where he challenges the God of Baal by his God, that one true living God. And so Jehovah was about to have a battle with Baal and guess who's going to win? Jehovah wins hands down. So Elijah called down fire from heaven, slew 480 prophets of Baal. He then outran Ahab's chariot ahead of an incoming supernatural rainstorm. I mean, talk about God showing his tremendous grace and his tremendous power. And after he slew those prophets, then all of a sudden, as fire came down and licked up the water around the altar he had, because again, remember this was a drought. At the end of three and a half years, water was scarce at that time. And yet he said, pour more water on it, pour more water on it, to where it was just dripping off the sacrifice, standing around there. And when the fire came down from heaven, it not only consumed the sacrifice, it licked up all the water around it. It evaporated all the water down there. There's probably steam coming up as well as fire and smoke coming down from heaven. And when the whole thing was over, it was the people fell down and began to worship God. Boy, was Ahab mad. The King Ahab was furious. And so, King Ahab, when he saw what was coming, Elijah saw what was coming. A storm was coming like they hadn't seen in a long time. I mean, the skies was black and all of a sudden that wind began to come, the rain began to come and Ahab was driving home in his chariot. A horse was pulling it. And suddenly Elijah runs by with the hand of the Lord on him, pulled up the skirts of his garment and outran Ahab's chariot all the way to Jezreel. And so again, we find this, he outran Ahab's chariot ahead of an incoming supernatural rainstorm. Your difficult beginnings are used by God to grow your faith. He has been for three and a half years on the mountain where the brook Cherith was. He's then gone to Zarephath and been there. And for three and a half years, God has supernaturally sustained him. But God has this in other words, words, your character is shaped at the times of difficult beginnings. Everyone goes through difficult beginnings. No one goes by instantly being thrown into a great pulpit. No one enters the ministry by going and having a big, gigantic ministry. I remember one student came and told me at the end of the, of the he was about to graduate. He said, God told me I'm going to have a ministry bigger than Kenneth Copeland's. I said, that wasn't God. I said, that is not true. With that attitude, you'll never have a ministry bigger than Kenneth Copeland. I said, on top of that, God isn't out to make your ministry bigger than somebody else's. Your ministry is your own. He didn't like that and didn't care. He said, no, I'm gonna have a bigger ministry than Kenneth Copeland. Well, guess what? I don't even know who he was, but I don't have to know who he was. I've never heard about anybody right now having a bigger ministry than Kenneth Copeland himself. I'm sure there may be, but nobody's bragging about it because why? God doesn't put you into those situations because again, you have arrogance and bragging uh, listen, where your character is developed is by the brook Cherith and also with the widows. And we find this throughout all history. 
But the point of it is, once you move into that public ministry, God wants your attitude to remain at the Brook Cherith and also at Zarephath with that widow. Those are the times that shape you. And listen, they humble you and your circumstances bring you to a place of humility and total trust and total rest in the Lord. Once you move into another place, there's nothing worse than a person that moves into a big ministry and suddenly gets a big head. You've lost everything that you learned back here at the Brook and also being fed by the widow. The point of it is, it comes back to this, is what happened in Elijah's ministry. We're going to find out something is Elijah's going to become discouraged here after a while. Again, your your attitude should remain at Cherith and at Zarephath. We find with Moses, Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. You know who wrote that? It's found in the first five books of the Bible. And who, the one who wrote that was Moses himself. Moses wrote down, he was the most humble man. He was, the, uh, again, being used by God because he developed that humility in the 40 years on the backside of the wilderness taking care of sheep. And once he gained that, in fact, at the end, before he went there, before Moses ever went into that place on the backside of the wilderness, he was one of the greatest orators, one of the greatest speakers, one of the highest in authority in the nation of Egypt. And from there he had to go because why? God had to sweat Moses out of Moses. And at the end of 40 years, Moses said, I can't even speak. Boy, does that sound different than the guy 40 years before that that could stand up and speak to multitudes and was probably headed toward a huge high position in the government of Egypt. And now he's saying, I can't even speak. And the moment he said, that's like God said, that's what I want. You've learned your lesson here. I want to be your mouthpiece. And if you can't be, have a mouthpiece and I'll even have your brother stand in his place. But again, when he went back there, Moses again began to speak, but his whole attitude was different. What a humility was in him. He wasn't out for position. He wasn't out for something great. He just wanted to do what God asked him to do. And this remained in Elijah for a while. And Elijah got back and in humility called out fire from heaven, in humility challenged these prophets of Baal, and then later slew the 480 prophets of Baal, and then literally ran ahead of Ahab's chariot because the anointing of God was all over him. Obscurity is where God prepares all of us for public ministry. You don't always remain in one place forever, but the times come to change location, but always requiring the voice of God. God always speaks at the right time, and God's voice guarantees he has already sent provisions ahead. I want you to have a copy of this book. And finally, in closing, I want to admonish you. If you are not a uh, partner with me in this ministry, I want you to be a partner. Even Elijah couldn't do it all by himself. God had people around him to help him. And later when Elisha came, the school of the prophets were around him. We always need those around us that we can help. And you know what? I assist other ministers. I give contributions and I'm also partners with other ministries. I would like for you to become a partner with me. Would you go to my website, bobyandian.com? You can find there a place where you can become a partner with this ministry. And like God's provides provision ahead, he's already spoken to you that you're gonna help me with this ministry. Thank you for being obedient to the voice of God. I'll see you tomorrow. Ministers, you can access valuable resources free at ministersclub.com. You'll find topical studies, sermon outlines, PDF books, answers to many questions, and plenty of encouragement. All free. Just go to ministersclub.com. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.